Hello and welcome to this third video about the motorized fader SDAW mixer control project. We have seen the first video, a demo of the final application, and I have made a first introduction to the main concept behind it. Then in the second video, I gave an overview from an hardware perspective showing electrical schema and PCB board design. And finally, by now, I'm going to give an overview from a software perspective. My intention this third video was supposed to be the last one. And however, at the end, I decided to split it in two because the result otherwise was going to be too long in time. In fact, in this video, we will review the configuration inside the Atmostat configuration interface. And in a fourth video, we will deeply dive into the code inside the IDE. First thing first, in order to develop the, fir the firmware of the microcontroller I chosen, the microchip Atmel SAMD11, I have used the Atmel Studio 7. In terms of the software framework, I have used the ASF4. And finally, in terms of the configuration tool, I have used the Atmelstar SL. Just as a reminder, let's see what is the full application schema in order to correctly identify the scope of this review. As you can see, the application is composed of three main devices. There is the motorized fader with a prototyped circuit that is in fact the object of this review. Then we have the controller board, which is controlling the data coming from the motorized fader until nine units accordingly to the Mac Universal Control Protocol, and is sending those data to the DAW. On the other way around, this board is collecting the data coming from the DAW and is routing this data to the various motorized faders. One point to notice here is that the data exchanged between the controller board and the motorized fader on one side and the data exchanged between the controller board and the DAW on the other side are all in MIDI format and are all the same in terms of content. So the duty of this controller board is quite simple and can be represented as a transparent router. Finally, that is the PC hosting, in fact, the DAW. Let's move now to the Atmel Start Online interface. Here you can see the first screen of these two, called a dashboard, where are shown the drivers of all the utilized microcontroller peripheral and one middleware here provided by the Atmel Start called QTouch used to manage the capacitive touch circuits. Let's start from the ADC, analog to digital converter, which I use to convert the voltage output from the linear potentiometer into the digital domain. Note that here I'm using the ADC with DMA, direct memory access, in order to transfer the value of the ADC conversion from the device to a variable via dedicated channel without affecting the CPU. To do so, I'm using here a driver provided by the ASF4. I'm setting the PA14 as input for the conversion and I'm setting the clock generator 3 as clock source at 8 MHz here. Very important thing is the conversion resolution at 16 bits. This is because the data structure that we will deal with to control the slider is a MIDI pitch wheel message, which is at 14 bits. The ADC of the SAMD11 MCU is natively 12 bits, but it can be promoted via hardware interpolation to 16. I set the external reference A as voltage reference, and I set the prescaler at 32, which is a good setting for this application. One of my findings in general is that when you're dealing with ADC, the frequency that you operate the device is quite important. Too slow frequency means low operation and accuracy issue, but even too high frequency could cause problem. I set the free running mode so that once launched, it keep on converting indefinitely. And then I set positive and negative max reference to a 6 and internal ground here. Other important parameter is the result adjustment set to 2 here in order to bit shift and move the value of the conversion result from 16 to 14 bits. Then finally, I set the number of sample, so to say the snapshot collected, to 16 here. Then I have a user device that I use to transmit and receive the data to and from the, control the controller board. As said before, the data exchange between the motorized fader and the controller board are already in a MIDI format, exactly as exchanged between the controller board and the DAW. That makes things much simpler. I'm using an asynchronous driver here and UR mode here. And finally, I'm using Circon 1 as device to manage the serial communication. I have set PA23 and PA22 as RX and TX, and I have set the clock generator 2 as clock source at 16 MHz. 
I'm also activating here the TX and RX ring buffer provided by the star configurator. However, keep in mind that as default, this buffer is set to 16 bytes and that you cannot change this value from the interface. The value is not enough for this application. For this reason, I have set inside the code a second circular buffer much larger in size that I will show later when we will look into the code. There is no parity here. The frame is set to 8 bits and there is one stop bit. The baud rate is set to 115,200 here. Actually, consider that we will deal with MIDI, which at the end is working at 31,250 in terms of baud rate. I think this value is certainly a bit high. Anyway, it's perfectly working. Then we have the timer driver and specifically an RTC device here, which is used by the Q-Touch middleware. This is automatically set by the start configuration when you add the Qtouch middleware, so I'm not going to review it. Then we have the timer ADC, which is the timer that I use to collect the ADC conversion data at a specific rate via the overflow interrupt handler of this time. We see later when I will show the code that actually I ended up in using this timer for some more activity than just the ADC related one. As you can see, peripheral here is set to TCC0. The clock speed is set to 8 MHz here, but it's then divided here by 8 by the prescaler. So in reality, the timer runs at 1 MHz, which means 1 million cycle per second, setting then the length of the tick to 1000 here. I reach 1 million divided by 1000, which means that each overflow event of the timer will occur every 1 millisecond. I often use this kind of configuration in at least one timer device of my application because then it's very easy to configure the duty of the timer inside the code, as I will show later in the code review. Finally, there is the Qtouch middleware that manages the capacitive touch circuit on the line potentiometer and detect when the metallic knob of the potentiometer is touched. As you can see, the sensor is set as a button. It has configured a self-cap functionality. The line input here is Y10PA16. Parameters here are 1 MHz clock, which in my experience is optimal for the configuration of this application. We have oversample parameters set to 64, which is quite a high number, but needed to stabilize the touch functionality. We have a threshold here set to 60, and then we have hysteresis set to 25% of the threshold value. Let's move to the clock. In terms of clock configuration, it's worth to say, that I'm not using an external crystal oscillator in this circuit. And I'm using the MCU internal 8 MHz oscillator instead. The clock source is connected to generator 1, 3, and 4. Clock generator 1, the 8 MHz here are divided by 250 in order to obtain the 32 kHz frequency here. In the generator 3, here, I stay at 8 MHz. In the generator 4, I divide the 8 MHz by 8 here in order to reach 1 MHz frequency here. The generator 1 is then connected to the DFLL. Into the DFLL here, I'm using as multiply factor 1500 in order to reach the 48 MHz here. Then the DFLL is connected to the generator 0 here, which is the default generator serving the CPU. And in fact, the CPU is clocked at 48 MHz. Always remember to set parameter of the NVM wait state here at 2 when you pump the CPU up to 48 MHz. Otherwise, it will not work. Then there is the clock generator 2 here which is connected to the DFLL and is divided by 3 here in order to, to achieve the 60 MHz. In terms of the clock assigned to various devices, as we have seen, we have the user, which is clocked at 60 MHz. We have the timer of the Q-Touch, which is clocked at 8 MHz. We have the timer ADC, which is clocked at 8 MHz. And finally, we have the PTC, which is the physical device inside the microcontroller managing the capacitive touch that is also clocked at 8 MHz. Going back to the dashboard, I want to highlight that there is actually another device configured in the microcontroller that is a timer counter, TC2 to be precise. 
that I used to control the PWM and that is not visible inside the Atman Star configuration tool. It is in fact configured at low level in the code directly setting the registers. I did this because in my experience and opinion the PWM feature is not very effectively managed inside the start interface. We will see this configuration later when we will explore the code inside the ID. Let's finally review quickly the I.O. configuration. In terms of I.O. configuration, as, I, as we said, I have PA14 here as AIN6 input analog for the ADC. Then we have PA16, which is the input for the Q-Touch, Y10. And then we have PA22, PA23, which are the TX and RX of the user. I have four more pins set in the code directly to drive four LEDs, one green, signaling that the circuit is powered up, one orange called operation, signaling that the fader is moving autonomously, one red called touch, signaling capacitive touch on and off, and one blue LED, use it for test purposes. And finally, there are two more I.O. as PWM pads, which are, as said, configured as low level. That's all for Atman Star configuration. When I will share the source code of the application, there will be, of course, also the file containing the star configuration that you will be able to upload into the online interface to see everything I have shown. In the next video, I will show the code inside the ID. Thanks very much and see you.